You're listening to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. Visit our website for free resources to aid you in your pursuit of self-liberation. Old Vanu publications, podcasts, guest articles, and much more. Go to vanupodcast.com. And now, your hosts, Shane and Jason. And welcome to the Vanu Podcast, the podcast making you invulnerable to the coercion of the state and the servile society. I'm your host, Shane, coming to you from the Free Republic of Pasnia. For more information, visit pasnia.com. So today we're going to begin with an article by Rayo, originally published in the spring 1969 edition of Innovator titled, Self-Liberation Ways, a Compilation and Evaluation. Then, using Rayo's suggestions as starting points, uh, let's have a short discussion about potential second realms uh, slash the Kiravanu home bases that you may not have thought of yet, uh, or at least ones that I'd like to bring to your attention again. Uh, without further ado, here's Rayo's article. I'll be back after to discuss. Self-Liberation Ways, A Compilation and Evaluation, Spring 1969, by El Rayo. Various ways for individuals and small groups to achieve personal freedom have been proposed or reported in Innovator and other libertarian journals. This article is a review and comparative evaluation. Self-Liberation or Retreat Although self-liberation uses many of the same techniques as retreating, a distinction should be made. The retreater most likely finds the status quo tolerable, but wants survival insurance in case politico-economic conditions worsen. He acts in response to depredations of state. The self-liberator, on the other hand, wants to minimize vulnerability to the state so that he need not greatly concern himself with the details of its crimes. The self-liberator can be distinguished in attitude even from a retreater who has already found conditions intolerable and opted out. The latter individual intends to drop back in should conditions improve sufficiently. While the self-liberator may not prepare for specific disasters, he is apt to have better survival prospects than the retreater. He is living and spending most of his time at what, for the retreater, is probably only an occasional study and exercise. However, this is not to deny the value of retreat preparations for someone who, for whatever reasons, is not opting out now. Model Patterns of Living Five self-liberated and three servile, conventional lifestyle models are comparatively evaluated as to monetary costs, access, and facilities, present freedom, and future safety. For this purpose, a family of two adults and three school-aged children are assumed. The self-liberated patterns are clandestine urban. The family lives in rented, furnished apartments or houses in a large city. Their means of protection are anonymity and mobility. Renting is done under an assumed name. They move every few months, leaving no forwarding address, and change names frequently. Their actual residential addresses are given only to trusted friends, one parent at a time works, usually at a temporary job where he can arrange for taxes not to be withheld. The other parent educates the children at home and keeps them undercover during school hours unless they can be delivered to a libertarian school. They engage in free market trade with libertarian acquaintances when profitable. Underground Hideouts The family has a permanent home clandestinely constructed beneath uninhabited, non-privately owned land 50 miles from a large city. Their protection is provided by concealment. Access routes and entrances are well camouflaged. Entry or exit is usually at night. As funds are needed, one parent at a time commutes to temporary jobs in the city, utilizing a small camper for transportation and urban shelter. The other parent educates the children at home. For outdoor recreation and sunshine, the family makes excursions on the weekends. Remote homestead. The family has a cabin squatting on or under wooded land at least 500 miles from the nearest large city and 50 miles from the nearest non-libertarian settlement. Largely self-sufficient, they utilize foraging, limited gardening, and do-it-yourself techniques of all kinds. Funds for outside purchases comes from savings and perhaps location-independent work. If this is not sufficient, one parent at a time commutes annually to temporary city jobs, living while they're in a rented bachelor apartment. Education is at home. Their protection is provided by distance and concealment. The cabin is in dense timber. Large equipment and supplies may be underground. Cultivated crops, if any, are planted in irregular, natural-looking patches. Land Mobile Nomads The family lives in two campers. 
They have scouted and prepared a number of squat spots at different locations within 200 miles of a large city, but all on uninhabited, non-privately owned land. The family as a whole moves from squat spot to squat spot, remaining at each a month or two. The pattern of movement is somewhat seasonal. When funds are needed, one parent at a time commutes weekly to the city, utilizing a small, minimally furnished camper for transportation and city housing. While in the city, he parks at work or on residential streets, a different one each night. The other parent and children live in a large self-contained camper, which remains at a squat spot, which is where the children are educated. For auxiliary storage, they have caches or rented space near some of their squat spots. They do some foraging, but partly because of easy access to the city work and stores, rely mainly on purchased supplies. Protection is through concealment while at a squat spot, mobility when disturbed, and anonymity while traveling around the city. If questioned, they are on vacation from somewhere else. Sea Mobile Nomads The family lives aboard a large sailing yacht, moored most of the time in uninhabited caves at least 500 miles from any large city. They sail to a new moorage every few months, migrating seasonally. When traveling, they stop at various ports for supplies. Protection is through distance, concealment, and mobility. For economy, the boat is probably registered in a country foreign to the mooring places. If questioned, they are tourists. Education is provided aboard. Much of their food comes from foraging, both at sea and on land. Funds for outside purchases come from location-independent work, chartering, and savings. If this is not sufficient, they moor for a few months near a coastal city for temporary jobs. The servile patterns are urban rental, urban ownership, and rural ownership. Comparative Evaluation Capital outlay in thousands of dollars for the various accommodations is estimated in Section 1 of the table, which can be found at the article on the website, vanupodcast.com. To simplify comparison, accommodations are purchased or rented new and fully equipped. Of course, with all models, substantial savings can often be realized through procuring used items and do-it-yourself construction. Additional expenses incurred when one person is working in a large city are estimated in Section 2B. Financing expenses for capital outlay are estimated in 2C. Depreciation, interest, and insurance are incurred directly by those who finance or lease their accommodations, and directly by those who pay cash. Regarding expenses for food, clothing, education, medicine, and recreation. While specific families would undoubtedly find substantial differences between the various models, no large general advantage of one model over another can be predicted. While remote, rural, and nomadic dwellers have less need for some items, other supplies and services may be more expensive in either money or time. Access to or facilities for various vocations and services are rated in Section 3. Grades are A for excellent through F for extremely poor. Of course, these ratings are rough estimates only. Opportunities for a particular individual will depend on his ingenuity and resources. Freedom from existing depredations is rated in Section 4. Trade restrictions include taxes, regulations, and licensing. Personal restrictions include interference with peaceful sexual activities, communications, use of drugs, or other unconventional behavior. A draft-age man is assumed to be outside the claimed territory of governments imposing conscriptions if a remote homesteader or nomad. Easily possible with these models. Safety from existing depredations of all kinds is best realized by distance and concealment, also through anonymity and mobility. In Section 5, the various models are rated as to safety from sudden catastrophe or long-term destruction. Sudden catastrophe includes nuclear, biological war, large-scale looting slash vandalism, natural disaster, suddenly imposed totalitarian state, or very likely a combination of these which destroy with less than 24 hours explicit warning. Protection from sudden catastrophe is best realized by being somewhere else, also through ability to move self and belongings rapidly. Long-term destruction includes totalitarian state, large-scale war, economic collapse, or any combination of these which develops gradually or with more than 24 hours explicit warning and continues for years. Survival of long-term destruction is best realized by moving self and property out of affected areas, also by ability to hide. A yacht, not dependent on roads or fuel or shipping space, again offers top protection. A camper ranks second. A furnished apartment which can be abandoned with little loss third. While the woodsman who remains in the remote cabin is in less immediate danger than the city or town dweller, survival of a disaster situation, especially totalitarian state, which continues for a decade or longer, is less likely. An underground shelter with well-camouflaged entrance is very safe, so long as one remains inside. Need to venture out for supplies reduces its security. The homeowner is highly vulnerable unless he is willing and able to abandon his property or sell it for a fraction of what he paid. He will be locked in by a real estate market crash, which will occur when millions try to sell. 
Considerations with Children The presence of children provides added incentive for self-liberation, but can also introduce special problems. Libertarian parents, especially those who have decided that self-liberation is too much trouble, often overestimate their ability to influence development of the child and or underestimate the combined impact of authoritarian schools, attitudes of playmates, and mass entertainment media. The parents may console themselves that their child at least has a better total environment than they had, overlooking the fact that they are, in a sense, lucky accidents who developed as they did because of rare and probably unrepeatable factors. That for every individual who, for whatever reasons, overcomes the combined effects of mind mutilation mills and anti-life milieu, thousands don't. Of course, the parent can take the position that he only wishes to enjoy his children while they are little, like he would a kitten or puppy, and doesn't care what happens to them after that. This is at least a realistic attitude. The years from about 5 to 16 are in many ways the most conservative period of one's life. The child tends to be naturally motivated to learn and act in accord with the tribal customs of whatever culture he may be immersed in. He is easily captivated by grouped activities such as clubs and games, and he has little motivation to challenge the rules except in cases where they are obviously self-contradictory. By age 8 or so, he has learned most of the local customs and probably takes pride in his ability to cope with them. If then, he is abruptly moved to a quite different living situation, he is apt to dislike the change, yearn for the culture and pastimes he left behind, and return as soon as he becomes independent. This suggests that timing can be crucial. Those without children who want them should liberate themselves and, if at all possible, develop a mini-culture of several families holding similar values before beginning. Those with preschool children had best move fast, get out before the child's range of interest and action extends beyond the home. Those with children already in authoritarian schools have a serious problem and had best move continuously with careful attention to in preparation of the child. Pseudo-liberation Someone discontented with the status quo who fails to discover a way to be free is apt to return to some kind of pseudo-liberation. Superficial changes in living pattern which do not bring significantly greater freedom. These include Agrarianism, moving to populated rural area or small town. While danger from such forms of coercion as nuclear war may be less, the villager lacks the anonymity of the urban dweller or nomad. And while non-libertarian neighbors may be more self-responsible and self-sufficient in some ways, most will be as misinformed and neurotic as their urban brain brothers, and even less tolerant of nonconformists. Children will have little alternative to the local indoctrination center. If kept at home, they will almost certainly come to the attention of official child molesters. A small town may be a reasonable choice for an elderly person who intends to retire in every sense of the word. For anyone else, it is probably a cop-out. Immigration to another semi-slave state. While many nations have somewhat more overt freedom than the U.S., none come close to complete liberty. In time and monetary costs of immigration, including learning new professional activities, social customs, and perhaps language, are substantial. With the same or less effort, one can change one's way of life and realize much greater freedom and safety. Of course, sometime in the future, small countries or free ports may offer substantially complete freedom, and then conventional immigration will be worth consideration. Conventional immigration, attempting to transplant one's present way of life to another country, should be distinguished from international mobility, a part of a new and self-liberated way of life. For example, while I would certainly not discourage a draft teacher moving to Canada, I would recommend against settling down and buying a home there, suggesting instead a remote nomadic or urban clandestine way of life. Canadian laws may change at any time. Subjectivism, evading reality through drugs, mysticism, television, or games, has been the most popular form of pseudo-liberation. At least one libertarian intellectual who, inconsistently as anti-drug, has offered a justification for subjectivism along the lines of, No matter how much your actions are restricted, you are free so long as your mind is free. But isn't my mind always free? It is my ability to act which concerns me. Of all forms of subjectivism, psychedelics, which at least give intrinsically private trips, are probably least harmful, certainly much less than TV, which offers collective trips, under control of the FCC. I am astounded to meet supposedly rational people who would not dream of taking pot, yet think nothing of giving their children a boob tube. Objections to Self-Liberation Any self-liberation method, like anything else, has potential problems. There can be grounds for honest reservations but most of the more vehement opposition stems not from real obstacles, but from ignorance or psychological blocks of one kind or another. These include belief in the omnipotence of evil. There is no way to hide. With satellites, radar, and computers, etc., they will find you no matter where you go and what you do. This objection ignores, one, the limited resources of any state, two, the much greater concern of rulers with rival power seekers than with opt-outs, three, 
Available techniques for frustrating detection and identification. Technology is a two-edged sword. Such remarks are usually a confession of inferiority feelings and envy. In essence, one is saying, I'm afraid to become free, so I refuse to believe that it is possible. Appeal to collective duty. Instead of copping out, you should join my crusade and help achieve freedom for everyone. Besides presuming altruism, this ignores the really horrendous problems in reforming a large, far-gone state and the poor record of previous collective endeavors. A free society probably must begin with free individuals. Dichotomy between expression and conduct. Statism is basically an intellectual problem and requires an intellectual solution. The way to gain liberty is not by opting out, but by disseminating rational ideas. Not only is this a partial truth, see my editorial in Winter 1969 Innovator, but unnecessarily either-or. Some opt-outs are among the most effective communicators, Dr. George Boardman, for example. Equating self-liberation with technical retrogressions. You're abandoning thousands of years of civilization with all the benefits of the market to slink off someplace and live like a savage. Such an objection ignores what can be and has been accomplished. A modern remote homesteader who may have electric plants, freezer, power tools, stereo, jeep, and perhaps even amphibious airplane need not live like the pilgrims, nor does the neo-nomad with self-contained motorhome live like the Plains Indians. Products of civilization are used when appropriate. What the self-liberator probably does avoid is complete dependence on these. Utopian notions of liberty. Self-liberation does not provide real liberty. Freedom exists only when one can act without need to defy or evade coercion. But the latter kind of freedom has never existed on Earth. The American frontier, one of the freest societies known, included bandits and protection racketeers eager to prey on cowards and fools. Even in a new laissez-faire country with hypothetically non-coercive governments, there might be attacked by private criminals and foreign states. And lastly, low valuation of freedom. For me, self-liberation would be more trouble than it is worth. This is an honest objection, and is probably the real objection of many persons who offer other excuses. Their ancestors in spirit were Europeans of a century or two ago who became very interested in the New World and did much talking about it, but remained where they were. Liberty is the heritage of men with the will to be free. All right, guys, I uh, hope you enjoyed that uh, article by Rayo. Uh, again, it was titled self Liberation Ways, a Compilation and Evaluation from uh, the Spring 1969 edition uh, of Innovator. So just had some uh, some notes I wanted to, uh, to touch upon uh, regarding that article. And then, uh, as I said uh, there in the introduction, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, uh, potential second realms uh, slash secure volume home bases that uh, I want to uh, bring to your attention again. So uh, first off, I want to talk about, uh, or just briefly touch on uh, Rayo's suggestion of clandestine, uh, you know, uh, clandestine urban uh, living. Uh, so I think for this one, we've talked about it before, but especially now uh, with, uh, you know, 2020 uh, really being the, uh, the, the push to these, uh, these technocratic smart cities. Um, I'm not really sure if, uh, you know, living uh, uh, clandestinely uh, in, an, in a large urban city, uh, probably not really feasible anymore, uh, at, least in my, uh, at least in my opinion. Uh, today, uh, these large cities are more akin to open air prisons, uh, not to secure Vanu home bases. Uh, of course, it's certainly possible, um, you know, with, uh, the more, with, with more people, it's easier to blend in. Uh, but, uh, yeah, I mean, with, uh, with, yeah, with these smart cities, with, uh, all, with the surveillance state, the police state, um, yeah, I just don't see that as really being a, being a high possibility, at least uh, in you know these these cities in the U.S. To say maybe in, in foreign countries uh, might be a, a more more plausible scenario, but it's just not something that I see uh, as, as as possible, and uh, not something I see as uh, as preferable. And uh, there are definitely better solutions out there. Uh, but again, we've talked about this before. There there are folks that are you know maybe stuck in the cities for for whatever reasons, and uh, that might be their their only option at least for right now. But uh, I figured I'd go ahead and make that comment uh, real quick. Uh, second would be uh, Rayo's suggestion of uh, underground uh, home bases. And as we know from Jim Stum and uh, I guess what, what uh, history we do have, uh, the last we know of Rayo, uh, he was uh, investigating, uh, underground, uh, uh, investigating and experimenting with uh, underground structures. So um, at this current point in time, I mean, if the underground volume home base could be constructed inconspicuously and probably not on so-called public land, uh, like Rayo suggested, uh, suggested, unless it's far enough out there, obviously. But then again, it'd be hard to get materials. But uh, anyway, if the underground Vanu home base could be constructed inconspicuously, I think Rayo was onto something here. Um, without revealing too much and violating OPSEC, um, at the very least, for individuals who are going to be building, uh, you know, building a uh, building a cabin on a remote homestead somewhere, 
maybe consider alternate evacuation points and uh, barriers uh, slash impediments to entry. Uh, in general, just build up your security, uh, harden your Vonu home base uh, as per that uh, article, or I guess that chapter in uh, Kyle Riggins' book, uh, Just Below the Surface, A Guide to Security Culture, which you can pick up at libertyunderattack.com. Uh, so, um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> you know, going underground might not be, uh, you know, the, 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 the silliest idea. And, uh, again, with, with, I mean, we don't really know how the future is going to look. Yeah, really, really don't know. But uh, out of sight, uh, out of mind, that's the, the idea of Vanu. And if you're underground and people don't know you're there, uh, you can be pretty, uh, uh, if, pe if people don't even know you're there, they can't coerce you. So that's uh, kind of the idea. Now, number three is uh, Rayo's remote homestead suggestion. Uh, and I think that's highly relevant to, to what is taking place today. I mean, uh, this is this is my I guess my my focus right now, and the, the, the focus is to become as self sufficient as humanly possible on this homestead. Because as we've talked about before, uh, the more self sufficient you are, um, the less you need uh, you know interact, the less need for interactions uh, with the servile society. And concomitantly, uh, this will also reduce the amount of money needed to survive. Uh, again, freeing you from the servile society. And with uh, you know talk about uh, you know the U.S. digital dollar, and uh, and, and that coming down the pike. I mean, uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't think this is going to be an option for, for a lot of folks. I think it's, it's going to be they have self-sufficiency or they're going to be forced into a system that they, that they disagree with vehemently and that they don't want to be a part of. Obviously, uh, you know, we, 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 we've, we've talked about, uh, plenty of times before the, the, the advantages of mobility, but, uh, I think, uh, a similar advantage here is self-sufficiency. Regardless, the point is, uh, to, to free us, uh, as Venuans from the servile society and self-sufficiency, uh, you know, these, uh, remote homesteads, uh, certainly help with that. And furthermore, since humanity is basically being slow poisoned via the food supply, uh, public water, and an otherwise onslaught of toxins, uh, the more you produce for yourself, uh, the better off you'll be. And I know that may sound like hyperbole to some folks, but uh, that's that's where I'm at. Um, and there'll be a lot more on this uh, in the near future. I actually just uh, talked to uh, to, to uh, Brent Elias, uh, Blood of the Brave, yesterday. And uh, we're going to be doing an episode on, uh, on on health here in the very near future. As we both had uh, some similar uh, similar experiences where uh, where uh, Rockefeller, Rockefeller Medicine um, did what it was intended to do, uh, you know, make us sick and dependent upon them, and uh, we had to uh, you know take uh, take matters into our own hands to resolve that. Uh, but don't know his whole story yet, um, but uh, generally that's the the general trend. So, yeah, I mean, with my lambs, with my goats out here, I know exactly what I'm feeding them. I know exactly what they what, what's what's going into them. I know exactly what supplements they have. I know exactly all of these things, right? Whereas if you go buy feedlot meat <laughs> at the uh, at the grocery store, I mean, yeah, you're gonna get uh, you're gonna get all sorts of uh, all sorts of uh, stuff that you probably don't want to be consuming. Another advantage of self sufficiency is you have control over raising, uh, you know, your food. And in case of vegetables, again, you know, not using uh, you know toxic pesticides, agrochemicals, uh, and things of that nature, uh, certainly advantageous and uh, better for your health. Uh, again, like I. I, I <laughs> A lot of folks think it's, you know, bacteria and uh, viruses that cause a lot of these things. But the more I look, the more I look, it's, I just think we're, we're, we're exposed to so many toxins nowadays. Um, it's, it's, it's an onslaught, as I said, whether it's food, water, home care, chemi you know, home care uh, products, laundry detergent, um, these endocrine disruptors that, uh, you know, like, uh, uh, like shampoos and, and, uh, um, and those sorts of things. Basically everything that's uh, that you that you know we consume from the grocery store is just full of these toxins. Anyway, anyway, uh, next land mobile nomads plus remote homestead. Um, yeah, this is uh, I guess yeah partially talking about the remote homestead again, but it's something I've discussed a number of times myself, and uh, that's you know this seems to be the model for the second realm, uh, mostly permanent autonomous zones uh, serving the nomadic self liberators. Uh, it's the alternative infrastructure instead of uh, going to the grocery store um, because you have to have mandatory vaccination certificates or something like that down the road. Um, you know, self liberators and venuans might not even have the option to go to those places, and therefore it might just be a necessity that these these outposts, these these permanent autonomous zones, turn into they turn into the grocery stores, right? For for these self liberators who uh, are otherwise nomadic. So that's that's kind of how I'm how, how I'm seeing it. Uh, that's that's kind of how things are looking. And uh, I mean, yeah, it's it's definitely definitely going to be necessary as we as we go into the future. Uh, and as I wrote, uh, I think the yeah, first couple chapters are, are definitely out on on, on the website. But uh, as per my fiction book, I mean, um, yeah, this isn't going to be a, a, a choice um, for people anymore. It's uh, you know, as per uh, Catherine Austin Fitz when she was on, uh, on, on on James Corbett's podcast. Uh, the middle of the road's disappearing. Uh, you could kind of go along to get along, and uh, that was fine. 
but uh yeah we're 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 at a point now where where there's uh there's there's uh there's there's a couple paths that uh, individuals can go down and it's uh basically being forced into a forced or i guess voluntarily <laughs> consenting to a uh you know technocratic totalitarian uh surveillance system social credit system and then the the other path of people who can can see the writing on the wall uh and understand that if freedom is going to exist in the future um then uh, we need to go a different way for sure so um yeah i think that's uh, all i have for number four and uh, the last the last uh, point on rayo's article is that um you know in reference to the chart i'll put it up on the fascist tube video bit shoot um and also put it in the post uh, at vani podcast dot com slash 85 uh, where you can find the show notes uh, for this episode. But uh, yeah, I'm not sure how much use this chart will be now, 50 some years later. Obviously, all the prices are not even... <laughs> Hell, they were already bad enough in 2019. But now in 2020, the inflation is going to be even worse. So um, regardless, numbers the numbers might not help you too much, but I think it could at least provide an example of uh, how to select slash determine the most Vanu uh, lifestyle available to you. Uh, yeah, I guess it way advantages, disadvantages, uh, that, that, uh, all that good stuff. So now on to the uh, the final part of this podcast, uh, potential second realm slash secure Vanu home bases. That's, uh, I think, are worth mentioning. Uh, so if you recall our episode with John Vibes, uh, he discussed a popular rave site called God's Basement. Uh, the owner of this church allowed the ravers to party there for quite some time. Uh, I'm not sure if there was an agreement, uh, cash or otherwise, don't recall, uh, or if maybe the owner of the church was just of like minds. Uh, regardless, John spoke to the efficacy of this Taz as a rave location, and uh, when it was busted, uh, they moved on. Uh, as per the fact that it was a task. Well, a uh, listener reached out to me with a similar consideration that I uh, I thought was interesting. Uh, this individual would know, would be in a position to know, and uh, uh, estimates that at least 10 to 15% of pastors are libertarians, and that most churches are empty most days of the week, which, yeah, makes sense. For a small fee, this individual guesses that churches could be used as second realms for multiple purposes, uh, possibly a site for business, maybe safe rooms for self-liberators that may find themselves in trouble, uh, etc., so long as the behavior is not morally reprehensible, which makes sense, uh, which certainly, certainly makes sense. And generally speaking, I mean, outside of massive regular raids like what happened at the uh, aforementioned God's Basement, how often do you hear of raids or busts happening in churches? I mean, uh, I feel like it's a very plausible option uh, if a reliable proxy merchant could be located. Uh, something I wanted to bring up, something I wanted to mention uh, for you to take into account. And similar to these mass megachurches, uh, something that Colin and I have talked about before. Uh, abandoned industrial slash business parks or otherwise abandoned property. So with the great scamdemic of 2020, I'd like you to consider for a moment the amount of foreclosures and otherwise abandoning a property that will take place over the coming months. With the whole world shifting towards the technocratic digital world, Physical places of businesses are disappearing as they, they have been already for, for years, but um, especially going to be the case now, uh, meaning there will be a proliferation of abandoned industrial slash business parks uh, or abandoned property in general. Uh, now, of course, I don't recommend violations of person and proper, you know, violations of property rights, but honestly, I'm kind of to the point that mega corporations that participate in so much fascism and communism have no claim to property rights uh, in this instance, possibly banks with foreclosed properties. Uh, in the spirit of argumentation ethics, these megacorps are dialogically stopped. Just considering how much money they've indirectly robbed from individuals, um, not in, you know, their lobbying for regulations that would put their, their small business competitors out of business. Um, there's so much fascism and communism. I mean, this is not a market economy. Of course not. Um, <laughs> of course, there's nothing free market about it. Um, nothing whatsoever, especially when it comes to these megacorporations who are basically just extension, they're just basically just arms, extension arms of the state. It may not be the most uh, popular uh, opinion, but uh, then again, I would really love to see an anarcho capitalist try to say that like Halliburton or Lockheed Martin are like emblematic of the free market. They're private businesses, right? Anyway, this is uh, something Colin and I have talked about before. Uh, you know, some of these industrial business parks are so large that it'd be really easy to hide away hidden apartments, um, trading areas, uh, etc. And again, you know, if these things are going to be constructed from the ground up, whether it's an industrial business park or whether a homestead, whatever it may be, um, always, I guess, just just please consider, um, <laughs> uh, yeah, please consider all of the possibilities. You know, plan plan ahead, plan ahead. Um, if you're going to be constructing, which I mean, I don't know how, I don't know if why this would be a case, but if you're going to be constructing a massive business park or something like that, um, you know, hide stuff off blueprint, things of things of that nature. Get creative, get creative. 
So I think that's uh, about all I have for you today. Uh, please check out the website, vonnypodcast.com. Uh, for free Vonnie books, a list of all of our past episodes plus archives. Uh, you can find the Vonnie Life Forum and much more. Again, the website is vonniepodcast.com. And uh, also make sure to subscribe wherever you're tuning in, uh, whether it's Fascist Soup, Bit Shoot, or your favorite podcatcher. Uh, certainly appreciate that. Along with sharing the podcast, articles, uh, or the freedom of strategy, freedom strategy of Vonnie Rounds. Also, make sure to check out Libertarian Tech Publications, a publishing outfit dedicated to freedom, and more specifically, solutions to increase personal freedom. Uh, some of the aforementioned free books are uh, available in paperback format, along with one-of-a-kind agorist uh, anarchist fiction and forays into other relevant subject matter, such as our newest release, A Vanu Guide to Firearms by Josiah Warren. To check out our catalog in full and dis- and uh, to check out our catalog in full and other discounted bundles, please visit libertyintertech.com. Liberty Intertech Publications, share your story, find your freedom. A little shorter of an episode today, but um, I'm okay with that, especially considering the fact that, uh, yeah, last week I think there's like eight hours of content. So, or this week, regardless, like the past seven days there's like eight hours of content. Uh, so, hope, hope, hope you enjoyed this shorter episode, and uh, yeah, and until next time, folks, stay safe and stay liberated. I call the shots as they are. I tell you the truth, no matter who it hurts or helps, even if it hurts me. And oh, how you hate it. Oh, how you hate to hear the truth. The man who tells the truth is universally disliked by every person. Because every person has an agenda and is hiding behind a fantasy which the truth penetrates like an arrow and leaves him stripped naked before the whole universe. And he does not like that. But yet it must be. For a great man once said, my leader once said, Seek ye the truth, and the truth will make you free. Nothing else will. And without the truth, no man or woman is free, can be free, or ever will be free.